Okay, in this uh, podcast, I'm going to just uh, briefly talk about uh, two sects, um, two Jewish sects, uh, the, the scribes and the Pharisees, and then in some other podcasts, I'll talk about the Sadducees and the Essenes. So, uh, first of all, with the scribes, um, so uh, primarily scribes, what we see in the New Testament, oftentimes with uh, Jesus encounters people who are called scribes. And uh, scribes, at first, are primarily like secretaries. These are people who have the skills uh, to be able to, to write. And so uh, that is a skill that not most people have. And so being able to be copyist or being able to write down, uh, take notes, uh, to be able to uh, make records. So that's what a, a scribe basically is. And somehow these uh, arose during the shift away from the temple uh, that occurs after um, Jews return back to uh, Judea uh, after being in Babylonian uh, captivity. And so we'll see the rise of these individuals. So someone like an Ezra uh, might be seen as a scribe, uh, people who can write down things. And uh, because they can write, um, and they can read, uh, they become experts. Um, and uh, so that's what we're, especially experts with uh, Torah or experts with, with the law, they can uh, read it and then their uh, skills at writing are necessary for um, copying, making copies of it. So they did, they tend to gain prominence during this period of time. Um, over the priest. So the priests are people who primarily take care of cultic activities. And uh, But if someone needs to understand how to observe the law, uh, individuals or communities, uh, a scribe is someone who can tell them uh, what is in the book, since most people uh, are probably going to be illiterate or they're going to have very limited uh, abilities at reading. Uh, having someone who knows how to read this material and then explain it to them or uh, let them hear what the, the words are so that they can understand uh, what it is that they need to do in particular cases. So they're going to gain a, an influence uh, amongst the populace uh, over the priest. Uh, their, so their primary roles were kind of scholarly in the sense of uh, preserving, as it were, knowledge preserving records, and also religious in the sense that they are people who are seen as kind of experts uh, in the law. Uh, they also seem to serve as counselors. They served as judges. They even sometimes served as rulers. Um, so we'll see uh, scribes playing uh, various different roles uh, within the Second Temple uh, Jewish period. Um, they are associated as well with a, a variety of groups. So you could have a scribes of the of the Pharisees. In other words, uh, scribes who become employed by people who have a Pharisaic outlook, or scribes of Sadducees. So um, people who are kind of employed or use their uh, technical skills uh, in support of of people who have a Sadducean outlook. Or you, we want to think about the Essenes. They must have had scribes, people who wrote down uh, their rules and wrote down their their beliefs, uh, made copies of the old, you know, uh, copies of scripture. So uh, they can be associated with a variety of groups. They're not a kind of a group um, of themselves. Uh, and some of them seem to be that they were uh, self-supported, uh, so that uh, not all, not all of them were self-supported. Some people could probably be employed as scribes. Uh, but um, uh, some could be self-supported, and um, so they come obviously from some type of wealthy um, background in order to provide their services to others. All right, now talk about the Pharisees. Uh, so this is a very influential uh, group um, as far as the early Christian movement is concerned. We see Jesus um, uh, having... Uh, discussions with Pharisees and sometimes disputes with Pharisees, and uh, we'll see that you know Paul, uh, the apostle, um, uh, either was or is a Pharisee, and um, we also see in the Book of Acts that certain Pharisees uh, joined the Christian movement. So 
uh, having a good understanding of the Pharisees is really quite important. Uh, so the name derived from a Hebrew word um, that meant to separate. And so this is a curious um, bit of etymology. Uh, we don't know um, how this term is being used for this group of people. Now, one of the curious things is that uh, with the exception of the Apostle Paul, if he continues to be a Pharisee after he becomes a Christian, and there, couldn't, there shouldn't be a reason why one couldn't be both a Christian and a Pharisee, um, but um, when he, um, if he says in Philippians uh, that uh, he is a, a Pharisee, uh, there is no verb in uh, Philippians when Paul is counting um, what his life used to be like, uh, so he doesn't say he was a Pharisee. He could be is a Pharisee. But if he is a Pharisee, when he uses that term uh, to describe himself, uh, that would be quite unique because we don't have any evidence of any practicing Pharisee using the term Pharisee to refer to themselves. The term Pharisee is used oftentimes by non-Pharisees to des describe these people. And so, um, trying to understand what this term, um, you know, in what sense uh, is the idea of separate um, being used to describe them. So, for some, uh, some think, well, maybe they are called that because they are perceived as people who separate themselves from other Jews. Uh, in other words, because they become uh, quite concerned with a ceremonial cleanliness. Uh, they may not have interactions with other Jews who they think are unclean or could contaminate them. Um, but um, more likely, I think, is this term is referencing one of the uh, important practices of the Pharisees, and that is the Pharisees were people who took very seriously God's law on tithing. Uh, to tithe is to take a tenth of your goods and to separate that those goods from the rest of the goods and what you have separated then is dedicated to God. So um, the the law about tithing um, you know would have been interpreted by lots of people in, in different ways in terms of what gets tithed, but it does look like the Pharisees are people who are tithing minutia that are coming into their possessions. So we have a, a reference in uh, Matthew's Gospel where Jesus talks about the Pharisees who will tithe mint, dill, and cumin. So these are like spices. And when they separate them, that means that if these things come into their house, they take a tenth of it, separate it to the side, and dedicate that to God. In other words, they don't take a personal benefit from them. So um, anyway, the the what their name is deriving from and uh, how it was used is a, is wrapped up in a little bit of mystery. Uh, so the earliest use, as I said, may seem to be from Philippians three five, where Paul is using it. Uh, in rabbinic sources, uh, they are called the perushim. So uh, we still see that it's coming from the same word, um, and but these are rabbis. So these rabbis are not necessarily identifying themselves as uh, Pharisees, um, but they are making reference uh, to this uh, group of people. So we have no evidence showing the term Pharisee as a self-designation. They arose as a scholarly purist group. In other words, um, this is a group that becomes concerned with how do you keep the people of God pure when they are surrounded and infiltrated by non-Jews. So uh, part of the reason why uh, Israel, our Judeans, um, were exiled is because uh, they have con they contaminated themselves with the impurity of idolatry. So God uh, condemned them for their idolatrous practices and be becoming unclean. So 
So when they, so when the Jews returned, you know, and start focusing in on the law, and they some start seeing these commands about purity. Of course, in the book of Ezra, we see, for instance, you know, trying to put away foreign wives and trying to do other things that separate Jews from non-Jews to maintain a distinction. Now, all during this time, Jews are being ruled by non-Jews, and there are non-Jewish uh, representatives in the area, and there becomes this um, greater presence of non-Jews. So it becomes this concern amongst certain people, and then we, particularly with the Pharisees, who really try to emphasize this purity aspect. And so what are the ways in which God calls for purity? And if they could become pure, if all of Israel would become pure, then God would deliver them from their uh, captivity. I mean, they're still captive to some kind of ruling, ruling power. Uh, so they sought to live in accordance with extra-biblical teaching uh, that we refer to as halakot. So halakot uh, comes from a Hebrew word that mean from halak, which means to, to walk. And so halakot is how one walks. And so what we see is, um, you know, the law is oftentimes, the Torah is oftentimes not specific in all the many different cases that Jews now find themselves in. And so certain teachings have to be developed that are not explicit in the law. And so for uh, the Pharisees, it becomes important to develop this teaching so that um, you can know then that you are keeping the law. Because if you ob obey one of these teachings, one of these halakha, then you should be assured that you are not violating the law. So the halakha kind of becomes what the rabbis later on will call a fence around the law. Uh, so uh, there's an understanding of what the law requires. You add, as it were, extra regulations or rules so that you don't violate the, the law. It becomes like a warning bell to you. Um, and so um, that's what they're uh, doing. And what we sometimes see Jesus engaging with Pharisees over is their particular halakot. Jesus doesn't disagree with Pharisees about obeying the law. Jesus believes that the law should be obeyed by Jews. But uh, what teachings one develops in order to protect observance of the law is where Jesus and the Pharisees are uh, contentious about, or some Pharisees. Um, now, uh, we don't know if um, in the Dead Sea Scrolls there is a reference, of the Dead Sea Scrolls, the, the participants um, out at Qumran, um, make reference to uh, people they call seekers of smooth things. And some scholars have wondered whether or not maybe these seekers of smooth things may be a reference to the Pharisees. We don't know for certain, but if so, then that would show an indication of the Essen community or the Qumran community being aware of, of the Pharisees. And some have also wondered if a work, you know, um, part of the pseudepigrapha, uh, the Psalms of Solomon, uh, whether or not this may have been a Pharisaic work. Again, no person is identifying themselves as a Pharisee who is the author of the Psalms of Solomon, but they think that some of the outlooks and the views that are in that book may align with Pharisaic perspectives. So the Pharisees are a group, we first kind of see them uh, coming onto the scene when they are opposing uh, the Hasmoneans, when uh, John Hyrcanus uh, becomes high priest. So John Hyrcanus, uh, the, the, the Hasmonean families are priestly families, but they are not from the line of priests that, go, that have the authority to become 
a high priest. So usually that's with the, the Zedekite uh, family by, by this time. And so that a high priest should be someone uh, whose father was a high priest, grandfather was a high priest, or family members are, are, are high priests. So it's a hereditary position, or it should have been. But during the time of the Hasmoneans, uh, and really even prior to the Hasmoneans, uh, the high priesthood it becomes an appointed position. So um, someone like an Antiochus Epiphanes has appointed someone to be the high priest who would align with his particular agendas for promoting Hellenism. Well, after the Hasmoneans take control of Judea and reestablish, you know, temple practices, re, you know, protect Jewish observance of Sabbath and uh, other religious practices. Well, one of these rulers, um, John Hyrcanus, takes on the role of high priest, but he's not a Zadokite. So it may be that the Pharisees are in opposition to, uh, to this, uh, this decision. Uh, they were influential during the time of uh, Salome Alexandria. Uh, Alexandra. So um, uh, prior to this period, 76, 67 BC, the Pharisees are, are, are people who are not in power. Now, we don't know, you know how many people there are out there who, are, who hold to Pharisaic outlooks, uh, but they are on the outside. So, of course, if they oppose you know, the ruler, of course, they're going to be on the, uh, on the outside. But... Um, uh, Salome Alexandra's husband, um, uh, Janaeus, uh, Alexander Janaeus, he, um, he opposed the Pharisees uh, as well, but that caused him a lot of problem, a lot of headache, because the Pharisees were popular amongst the people. So uh, kind of on his deathbed or as he was dying, uh, he told Salome that she needed to befriend the, the Pharisees. She needed to align with the Pharisees. So once her husband died, she makes this decision. She swings from the Sadducees to the Pharisees and empowered the Pharisees. So Pharisees all of a sudden then come to have great political influence in Jerusalem while she is queen. Uh, in Jesus' day, uh, they seem to be uh, anti-Hasmonean. So while you know they were uh, with Alexandria, uh, Salome Alexandria, uh, they uh, have power, but you know, once she her time is is finished, and there is civil war that breaks out between her two sons, the Pharisees again lose lose control, lose influence, and the Romans are are going to come in, and they're going to exercise uh, direct control over the region. So in Jesus' day, uh, they're anti Hasmoneans, meaning they don't really want any body from that Hasmonean family line, and there are some. Herod the Great marries a, a Hasmonean princess, um, and they have children, but uh, Herod kills them. Um, they don't want any of these Hasmoneans to be ruling, uh, and they're also anti-Herodian. They didn't want Herod the Great uh, to be ruling over them, and they're also anti-Roman. They don't really want the Romans to be uh, in charge. So that's kind of interesting when you see that anti-Roman. Um, a lot of people think that the Pharisees killed Jesus, but that's not really the case. We see the Pharisees are involved in confrontation with Jesus, and they they want to minimize his influence, his impact. They they really want to destroy him in the sense of they don't want him rising in, in popularity. But once Jesus gets to Jerusalem, um, his main uh, adversaries are not Pharisees. They are Sadducees. They are the temple priests who are aligned with Rome. I mean, the priesthood is aligned with the Romans uh, because the Romans have appointed the high priest, and so they permit them to exercise authority. Uh, and so the Sadducees are primarily made up of aristocratic families and the priests, and so Pharisees represent more populous people. So they're, um, they're anti-Roman, anti-Hasmonean, anti-Herodian. So in terms of some of their uh, other characteristics about them, uh, Herod's, uh, during Herod's time, uh, there was about 6,000 Pharisees, so during Herod the Great. 
uh, about 6,000 Pharisees. So that gives you kind of a number. So this number comes from uh, Josephus, who tells us a little bit about Pharisees. He's trying to introduce the Pharisees to his audience. He tries to introduce them in a way that makes them sound like a Greek philosophical school. Uh, their beliefs then are described in three major sources uh, uh, in the New Testament. Uh, so that's a primary source uh, in the work of Josephus uh, and also in rabbinic material. And while I'm not going to go into a lot of the different uh, beliefs that they have, I'll just highlight a couple here. So some of the major ones, they believe in divine sovereignty. So God is in charge, God is in control, and God is doing things in history to bring about events. Um, and so um, that means that God is also involved, as it were, in what individuals are, are doing. So um, one might say, you know, in a sense, it's kind of um, a predestined uh, I view, view of, you know, things are going to go according to God's plan. Things are determined according to God's plan, and things will carry out according to God's divine plan. So God is uh, in control, and what human beings are doing are responding in order to bring about God's will according to what God has already planned. So uh, they do, though, believe in uh, human free will uh, and that to humans make decisions and um, that uh, they ought to decide uh, to uh, turn to God and that um, things are not so determined for individuals that they cannot uh, choose. And I'll also mention about the idea of immortality. So this is really an important one. Um, so the idea is that for Pharisees, uh, there is going to be a life after death, uh, particularly for the righteous. Um, I'm not quite sure how they think of the unrighteous, what will happen to, to them, but at least for the righteous there is a future life, and, and this is represented in their belief in the resurrection, the bodily resurrection. So Pharisees are one of those Jews who believed in bodily resurrection, as did Jesus, as does the early Christians. So the Christian movement believes in bodily resurrection, just like the Pharisees do, um, and, but that is not a belief that is shared by, uh, by others. So the belief in the bodily resurrection is politically as well um, important because um, if you believe in that even though you die, you, God is going to raise you if you are righteous, then you are more likely or more willing, uh, more open to defying the state if the state even when the state threatens to kill you. Because if they threaten to kill you, you can think, well, go ahead and kill me because I will be raised. So it's much better for the state that you don't believe in bodily resurrection or don't believe in some kind of future positive afterlife for the righteous. Instead, that your only concern, or your basic concern is to live in this life because then the threat of taking your life becomes um, you know, more crucial, more more important. So, um, so but anyway, so the Pharisees are uh, a group that advocates a resurrection of the body, and so that's a very brief uh, introduction uh, to the Pharisees.